Good morning. We would like to welcome you to worship here with us at Jacksonburg. If you are visiting, you are our honored guest. Please fill out a visitor's card, which can be found on the pew in front of you, and place it in the collection plate at the appropriate time. It's possible to stick around after services and let us introduce ourselves. Please bear with me as I go through some items of note from the bulletin this morning. It's fairly lengthy, so I'll be up here a while. You may need water. If you did not pick up a bulletin on your way in this morning, please do so on your way out, or it can be found at jacksonburgcoc.com, as it likely contains information that I may not cover this morning. Upcoming events. Uh, tonight will be our monthly singing since we had our meeting. It is moved to tonight, so come with us and, and, and as we rejoice tonight. On September the 29th, the donations for the nursing home items are due on October the 12th, the men's breakfast at Cracker Barrel at 8 a.m. October the 13th, worship service at Lauderdale Christian Nursing Home at 1.30, also worship service at Cedar View Assisted Living at 2.15 p.m. On November the 10th, which is just around the corner, will be our homecoming. September the 22nd will be the baby shower for Michelle and Jared Hovatter. It will be held in the church annex from 2 to 4 p.m. They have chosen Grant Allison Hovatter as the baby's name. Their selections are at Walmart, Target, and Amazon. Also, they ask you to please bring a book instead of cards. If you would, write a note in there. They will cherish that forever. Please remember donations for the annual children's home projects, Lauderdale Christian Home, as well as the Fruit Basket Project are being accepted now. If you would like to, to donate or participate in this good work, please see Sister Maddie Gooch or Sister Della Cook. The elders request that each family bring four 16 ounce jars of creamy peanut butter per month. This supports a local charity that prepares and distributes backpacks that contain nutritious food for local children that do not have enough food to eat. We have a lengthy sick list. Um, I have these announcements. Sister Rosaline Gray is still in rehab at Mitchell Hollingsworth in room 15. She may be staying one more week. The address is 805 Flag Circle, Florence, Alabama 35630. Tammy Hanna, the daughter of Sister Linda Bogus, had one of her kidneys removed this past week. Sam Chandler is recovering from a stroke and was transferred to rehab this past week. Faye Chandler is dealing with cancer on her nose. Please send cards of encouragement to 228 North Kirkman Street, Florence, Alabama 35630. Our sick list, as I said, is very, fairly lengthy. So please keep all of those in, our, in your prayers. Also, Becky, if you have any updates to the sick list, please give those to Becky so we can keep that current. As we traditionally do in September, we are collecting donations to assist with the expenses as well as encourage our college students. If you would like to make a contribution, please give it to Trina Ahonen owner before Saturday, Sunday, September the 29th. Our college students are Brooke Bain, P.O. Box 418, Mississippi State University, 39763. Evan Sweeney, U 302, University of South Alabama 307, North University Boulevard, Mobile, Alabama 36688. Lakin Sweeney, U 242, University of South Alabama, 307 North University Boulevard, Mobile, 36688. If you have the opportunity, please send encouragement cards to, to Maryland Parish, 417 Calhoun Street, Florence, Alabama. And I also have these announcements. Ahoy, it a boy. Please join us for a shower honoring Kenzie Wallace, and baby Charlie, October the 13th, 2019, from 2 to 4 p.m. at the Jacksonburg Church of Christ. I'm assuming it'll be at the annex. Their selections are at Target, 
and on Amazon. Dear elders, thank you for your support in the mission work we are trying to do in Northeast Thailand. Many great things are happening there. We're hoping to start a preaching training school in the next few months, so please pray for this effort. If you would like to receive a new, our newsletter by email, please send email address to paulpowers963 at gmail.com. Thank you and God bless Paul and Kim Powers. Lone Cedar Church of Christ Homecoming, September the 22nd. The speaker will be Al Bill. Bible classes start at 9, morning worship at 10, lunch at 11, afternoon worship at 1230. Gospel meeting at Hawk Pride Church of Christ on Hawk Pride Mountain, September the 29th through October the 1st. The guest speaker will be Sydney White. The schedule of services are 10 a.m. Bible classes, 11 a.m. Worship, lunch to follow after the a.m. worship. Singing at from 2 to 3. Sunday evening worship will start at 3 or 3.30, depending on how long they sing. On Monday and Tuesday, the meeting will start at 7 o'clock. North Carolina Church of Christ, do a gospel meeting. October the 13th through the 16th, speaker will be Bobby Carroll. The schedule of services are Bible study at 9, worship at 9.50, fellowship meal at 11, evening service at 1, Monday and through Wednesday it'll start at 7. Our order of services today, Brother jo Jared Hovetter will be leading our singing, Brother Connie Connor Cheney will have our scripture reading. Brother Gary Gooch will have our opening prayer. Brother Robert McClure will preside at the Lord's table. He will be assisted by brothers Danny Arnold, Lee Butler, Adam McCormick, Will McCormick, and Tommy Sayers. Brother Harrison will bring our lesson. Brother Darrell Ahonan will have the closing prayer. The announcements for next Sunday will be by Brother Robert McClure. Have I missed anything? Thank you for your time. We'll now enter into our worship. Good morning. Uh, I'm not Jared. He's at work. So he'll be here tonight. Let's start out with number 291. Number 291. <clears throat> I know not why.
84. Mm -hmm. 84. This time we'll have our opening prayer and our scripture reading. <clears throat> this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are my Bible reading this morning will be from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man who was there and was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that you have provided for us. That in accordance with your commandments, we come together as a collective body of your people upon this day to show our praise for you and to glorify your great name. At this time, we're mindful of the opportunities that we have to serve you. And our Father, we pray that we have been good stewards of that which you have provided for us, so that when we live before our fellow man, 
that they will see our good work and have a desire to come unto thee. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to be a member of this congregation, that we have the opportunities to work and to worship with one another in your kingdom so, so that a lost world can be brought to you. Our Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the standard that you have left for us, that when we live in accordance with your truth, we know that an eternal home with you is ours if we maintain that faith. Our Father, we're thankful for the gift of your Son, that through the sacrifice that you made of Christ, we have hope not only in this life, but a hope in an eternal home when this life is over. Our Father, we pray for our country. We pray for those who are in leadership. And may they ever realize that you are yet in control, that you have control of all of your creation. And may they guide us in such a way that we can have peace with ourselves, peace with one another, and peace with the world. And most important of all, that we can have peace with you. Our fa Father, we know that many times we fail you, that we do not do the things that you command of us, and sometimes we go beyond that which you have commanded. Forgive us of our sins as we stand before you, so that our lives might be clean and pure in your sight. Our Father, we pray that you will be with us throughout the remainder of this service and throughout life. And may we live in such a way when life is over here, we can live eternally with you. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's turn number 287, number 287. We sing this song, we want to concentrate on the Lord's Supper and the sacrifices that were given for us. <clears throat> I love the Lord, for he died my soul to save.
Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for the daily blessings that we receive from you. We're thankful, Father, for this opportunity and privilege to assemble here this morning to worship you, the true and living God. We're thankful that you loved us so much that you sent your only son to this earth, that he was crucified on the cross in our place, that through obedience to your will, we might have forgiveness of our sins. We're thankful now for this opportunity to commemorate that. Be with us as we partake of this unleavened bread, which to us is an emblem of his body as he hung on the cross. We pray, Father, that we might take of it in a way that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Here's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we continue our prayer of thanksgiving, help our minds to go back to that time in the Bible when they nailed Christ to the cross, how he suffered in agony on that day, how he shed his blood on that day, that we might have forgiveness of our sins through the shedding of his blood. Be with us now as we partake of this through the vine, which to us is an emblem of that blood. And we pray, Father, that we might partake of it in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable to you. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat>
Heavenly Father, help us to be thankful not only for our spiritual blessings that we receive from you, but for the many temporal blessings that we receive each day, for the opportunity to have an earthly family, to enjoy the love for one another, to have a church family and the love that exists there, that we might be able to do this and be free and not be in fear of anybody interfering with us. We're thankful for the opportunity that we've had to uh, earn a living and to return unto you a portion that we have purposed in our heart to do that. We pray it as we return it now, now that we might do it in a way that's acceptable to you. There's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. If you're using your books, you might want to mark number 23. Number 23 will be our song after our lesson. Then turn number 378. <clears throat> 378. <clears throat> Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old. Excited that you're here, and we hope that you find our time beneficial as we worship God this morning. 
and that you will want to come back and worship with us at any time you have the opportunity. A couple of announcements really quick before we get started in our sermon today. Didn't we have a great gospel meeting last week? Uh, Kirk Brothers was fantastic. We had a wonderful crowd every night. Uh, we had, of course, our members were here. We had people from the community show up. We had visitors from other, <clears throat> excuse me, other congregations show up. We had a great, great gospel meeting last week. So I want to thank all of you, especially uh, the men and the women. Uh, that cooked every night for him. We had a great time of fellowship every night at 5.30 uh, in the Annex. And so a lot of great things happened at the Jacksonburg Church last week. And we want to thank you for being a part of that. Also, one more reminder about our questionnaires. I know that you're probably tired of hearing about that, uh, but if you have not picked up a questionnaire in the foyer, you need to do that. If you are in junior high or older, you need to pick one up. Every man, woman, and child that is of junior high age and older needs to pick one of those up, and please get that to me as soon as you can uh, because I'm already starting my preaching plan for the rest of the year and also planning for next year to 2020. So if you have something that you would like to talk about, please indicate on the questionnaire. And I will be gone this Wednesday night. I wanted to go ahead and let you know about that. I'll be speaking uh, next Wednesday or this Wednesday night at the Rogersville congregation. I'll be in their uh, September series. I'm looking forward to that, but I will miss you. I know Gary will do a good job filling in the auditorium for me. And so if you are uh, able to be here, please be here on Wednesday night as well. If you have a New Testament text, and I really hope that you do, and you will want to follow along, please join me in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, one of the, the famous parables of Jesus. Many are called, but few are chosen, the parable of the wedding feast. Maybe you have a teacher in maybe middle school or high school that stands out to you. Is there one teacher in particular that you remember, maybe because of the way they taught the material uh, maybe because of the way that they connected to you and helped you understand the material. Well, I have one of those. My high school chemistry teacher was one of those because of the way that he taught the material. Uh, if you've had introductory chemistry uh, news flash, you don't want to. Uh, it, it's, it's not an easy subject, uh, at least for me. It just never really came naturally to me. But my high school chemistry teacher made his very best effort to help every student understand the material. He knew that people learn in different ways. Some are auditory learners. Some are visual learners. Some learn by diagrams and pictures. Others learn best by demonstrations. And so he took that into account as he tried to help us understand high school chemistry. I remember one day he taught different concepts in different ways. That's one thing that stood out about him. I remember one day he was teaching about how certain chemicals come together, and just in the middle of class, he was just in the middle of teaching, there was not a massive one, but it was a significant explosion in the back of the classroom, and there was glass breaking and things like that. And in the middle of his lecture, he just said, that's a great example of what I've been talking about all day today. And he had set the thing to go off, uh, during class and so that was his way of saying this is what I'm talking about when this that and the other come together in one glass flask boom that's what happens so he tried to teach in different ways so that everybody could understand the material I won't tell you how I did in that class despite his efforts I still made a B in the class, okay? But he tried his best to, under, to help us understand high school chemistry at a good level. When you look at the pages of the New Testament, we see another teacher that tried to do the same thing. Jesus is called the master teacher. He's not called that for nothing. He's not called that just because he's the Son of God. Jesus Christ was the master teacher. Because he, like my high school chemistry teacher, had one goal in mind when he opened his mouth to teach. That the audience, whether that be religious people, whether that be everyday common Jewish people, whether it be Gentiles, whether it be tax collectors and sinners, or whether it be his apostles, regardless of his audience, his goal 
was for them to understand his teaching. He taught different par- he taught different lessons in different ways. For instance, in Matthew chapter 17, Peter had a question about paying what is called the poll tax to the Roman government. And to illustrate the importance of paying the poll tax, Jesus told Peter to cast his hook into the Sea of Galilee. And the first fish that he would find, he would take out, open its mouth, and in its mouth would be a shekel. And that would be the, the poll tax for Jesus and Peter, and you need to pay that. Jesus also taught a visual demonstration In John chapter 6, he took a little boy's quote-unquote Levitical lunchable, five loaves of bread and two fish, and he multiplied those five loaves of bread to feed over 5,000 men to illustrate one singular principle found in John 6, 48, that I am the bread of life. Despite Jesus' different ways of teaching, the Bible makes it clear, all four Gospels are abundantly clear, Jesus had one primary method. And that method was parables. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? That's the definition that we've all been taught. But another definition of a parable that I like to rely on is using the known of the physical world to teach the unknown of the spiritual world. Using things that you can see, hear, touch, and smell to teach things that you can't see, hear, touch taste and smell and that's what Jesus is doing here in Matthew chapter 22 but this text of the parable of the marriage feast in Matthew chapter 22 is strategically placed by our brother Matthew the contextual flow of this begins actually in chapter 21 beginning in verse 28 because in chapter 21 verse 28 Jesus is telling a series of parables with a common theme and the common theme yes The Pharisees will reject him and his message. And he uses three different parables to illustrate this. The first one there is is in Matthew chapter 21, the parable of the two sons. Jesus tells a parable about a father who has two sons. He looks at son number one and said, go work today in my vineyard. The son says, no, I'm not going to go, but he later regrets it and he goes and works in his father's vineyard. He looks at son number two and says, you need to go work in my vineyard today. The son says, I will, and he didn't go. Which one of these did the will of his father? And obviously, the one who did it was the one who actually went and worked in the vineyard. And Jesus uses that story to say that John the Baptist was the one who came preaching and teaching the kingdom of heaven, and you didn't believe him. And because you didn't believe him, you're not going to believe me, and therefore, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He then transitions in verse 30 to the parable of what we know as the wicked vine dressers or the wicked husbandmen, where a landowner leases his vineyard to some tenants to keep it while he's gone on his journey. And when he comes back from the journey, it's time for him to collect his share of the harvest. And so he sends a group of slaves to get the, the produce that is owed him because it's his vineyard. The landowners mistreat those slaves. They beat them up, and the Bible says they kill some of them. Rather than taking out his vengeance on them, the landowner does something unprecedented. He sent another group of slaves, and it's much the same theme. Same song, second verse. The vine dressers persecute those slaves and kill them. And then in an unprecedented move of grace, he sends his son, hoping that they will respect him. But his son meets the same fate as those slaves, and he too was killed. And he illustrates that to say that that's what you're doing to God the Father, and that's what you're doing to me, because you are rejecting me. And as a matter of fact, if you look there in about verse 43 and 44, Jesus uses this story to transition to an Old Testament prophecy that says the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And so he's using that as an illustration of what you are doing to me, to God, and to the Old Testament prophets. You kill them, you reject them. And so Jesus' goal of helping these religious leaders understand just exactly what they're doing is made clear in verse 45. After the first two parables of the two sons and the wicked vine dressers, Jesus has accomplished his goal. Because if you look at 2145, the text says that when the scribes and Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that they were talking about them. 
I could like to picture the scribes and Pharisees as Jesus is telling these stories. They're looking at each other going, oh me. He's hitting us right between the eyes. He's talking about us. Yeah, he's talking about us. Hitting us right in between the eyes. So Jesus accomplished his goal of the Pharisees understanding his teaching. But you know what? Sometimes us preachers, we get on a roll, right? We've accomplished our goal. We accomplish our purpose. But we get on a roll. And that's what Jesus does when we come to our text of interest in 22 verse 1. He's on a roll here. He's gotten his point across. They understand what he's talking about. But he tells one more parable, and that's what we want to focus on, the parable of the marriage feast. And his goal in this is not to, to, to pound, to beat a dead horse, as this expression says, but to help them understand the severity. If you follow through with rejecting me and rejecting my message, here is the ultimate consequence. And that's when we come to Matthew chapter 22. And it would have been easy for those in the first century to understand this parable, to understand what was going on here and to make proper application. But for us as 2,000 years removed, 21st century readers, in order for us to maximize the meaning of this parable and to understand the summary statement at the end, many are called but few are chosen, we need to understand the parable. And so what we're going to do is we're going to analyze, first of all, the parable that Jesus is telling. The parable is, in verse 1, it's introduced as a king throwing a wedding feast for his son. We're going to look at two first century concepts. The first concept is the concept of Jewish marriage. They have what is called, I like to call, the ABCs of marriage. First of all, this is in a time of arrangement. These marriages were arranged. The parents of a newborn Jewish boy, the parents of a newborn Jewish girl would get together and say... You know what? When our children become of age, they're going to get married. And so after that, they would raise their children faithful Jews. And when the time came, they got married. Uh, they were arranged to be married. They did not have a choice in the matter. And that's how the Jewish religion kept going. is because of arranged marriages. A faithful boy and a faithful girl would unite. And what would they do? They would arrange the marriage for their child and so on and so forth. So then they would have the arrangement. They would then become engaged, as we would say. That's the betrothal stage. And then the betrothal stage would last about seven months to a year. And at the end of that year, they would then have the ceremony where they would be married. And so when we understand Jewish marriage, we can then dive into the Jewish wedding, the concept of Jewish marriages. You'll see there in verse 1 that a king throws a wedding banquet for his son. That was not uncommon in the first century. As a matter of fact, it was a very common practice for the king to throw the best wedding banquet for his son that he could, hosting over 1,000 people in the palace at one time. And so he would then make the preparation for the wedding. He would prepare all the food. He would have the best wine that money could buy. The best meats, the best produce, the best everything laid out at this banquet. And when betrothal began, when the man and the woman would get married or get betrothed, the, the wedding preparation would begin. And immediately when wedding preparations begin, that's when all the invitations are sent out. I think today the protocol is like three months. But in the first century, it was a year. They knew a year in advance when the wedding was going to be, and they needed to be there. So the invitations would be sent out about a year in advance. And then because of the time gap, when all things were ready, the king would then issue another invitation. He would then send a messenger, what was often called a crier, into the streets. And the crier would say something to the effect of, Hear ye, hear ye, the wedding is ready. And he would shout it through the streets. He would go through the streets and just shout that the wedding is ready. If you have been invited to this wedding, you need to get ready because it's almost time to go. And to be invited to a, a Jewish wedding was an absolute honor in and of itself. It was an honor to be invited and you were expected to be there. There was no RSVP, 
All right. In a Jewish wedding, if you invited 80, 800 people, you prepared for 800 people because you thought that all 800 would show up. There was no, we can't come. You went. You put everything else aside so that you could go to this wedding. That's how Jewish weddings worked. And as we look at this story, that concept is really going to be key as we move through this parable. So he invites the wedding guest, and then once everything is ready... The king goes through, he sends the messenger. Then when the messenger is finished, later on the groom will parade himself through the streets and he will gather then. He would gather the invited guest, he would gather his bride, he would gather the wedding party. And as a group, all of the, all of the invited guests, the wedding party, the groom and the bride would all proceed to the site of the wedding. Now, typically in Jewish culture, the wedding site was the home of the new couple, the place where they would call home. And I am thankful that that is not true today because we would have had our wedding in an apartment, okay? That would not have been fun because of the cramped space. But for them, especially in this parable, it would be the palace. There would be plenty of room, so they would have plenty of room for everybody else. So then, after all of the wedding guests, the wedding party, the bride and the groom came to the wedding site, when everybody was there, they shut the door. And even if you were invited, if you were running late, you couldn't come in. That might sound familiar because in Matthew chapter 25 about the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, when the bridegroom came, what happened to the door? The door was shut. And those who were outside could not come in. That was Jewish culture. Once the door was shut, you can't come to the wedding. You can't come to the reception because you didn't come to the wedding because you were running late, etc. So that's how Jewish weddings worked in the first century. So as we scroll through this parable to understand the full meaning, let's plug the characters in. Now that we have the concepts, let's look at the characters. Who's the king in this story? Well, the king is God. God is the king, and he's throwing a wedding feast for his son, Jesus Christ. If you look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, and other passages in the New Testament, Jesus is presented as the bridegroom. So we know that the bridegroom is Jesus. God is throwing a wedding feast for his son. And he sends out an invitation. Now, who is invited initially to this wedding feast? Well, you can look at other passages like Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the Jews were the ones who were invited first. So God sent an invitation to the Jews, Matthew 10, verse 7. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God wanted the Jews to come to his wedding banquet. So he sends out an invitation to those who might be able to come. But the Bible says in verse 5 that they rejected the invitation. You didn't do that in the first century. Everybody at that point would have been like, they did what? And then in verse 6, the messenger that God sent to invite the Jews, who would be who? The Old Testament prophets. They did what? They killed him? They mistreated a slave of the king in the first century that was punishable by death. You were risking your own life if you laid a hand on the king's messenger. So at this time, the people would have been going, they did what? They rejected the invitation and they killed the messenger? What's he going to do? Well, in this story in verse 7, what does the king do? He gets angry. He sends his army and burns their city. Some commentators have suggested that is a very indirect reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So that might be what Jesus is talking about, that ultimately Jerusalem would be destroyed. So then after the king just leashes his rage, what does he then do? Say, forget the wedding feast altogether? No, what does he do? He sends other messengers. Who would those be? More prophets. More prophets telling, inviting the Jews, hello, you're still invited. The king wants you to come to the wedding feast. But then he decides... Those Jews that I invited, they're not worthy. So he tells the servant to go where? Go into the main highways, verse 9. The main highways that Jesus is talking about would have been those streets that 
were at the city boundary that led outside the city. And outside the city would have been the social outcast, the tax collectors and those who needed money. They would often place themselves outside the city so that people coming out and coming in would be forced to contact them and they might get some money. So the the king sends those messengers, those prophets, out to who? Those who were outcast. Who would that be in the spiritual sense? The Jew first and also the Greek. Those are the Gentiles. And Jesus says, those Jews weren't worthy to come to my feast. So I sent the messengers out, and they went and invited the Gentiles. And what happened when we invited the Gentiles? The house was filled with guests. Sidebar, that's how God wants his kingdom. God wants his kingdom here on earth. He wants his kingdom in heaven. The eternal home in heaven that God has prepared, he wants it filled with guests. God wants his home in heaven to be filled with people. The house was filled with guests. The Gentiles, the tax collectors, the socially outcasts, the religious outcasts, what did they do? They accepted the invitation. We got an invitation from the king. The king wants me to come into his house. I'm going. And so the Gentiles accepted the invitation. But then... The king comes out to greet his guests. He's glad they're there. He's glad that there are people there to partake of that. But there's one person who doesn't have on what? He doesn't have on a wedding garment. Now that's an interesting thing in Jewish culture because there's evidence that oftentimes if the king was the one throwing the wedding banquet, he would provide them clothes to wear. There's an interesting story found in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 18, where Jehu, one of the good prophets or the good kings of Israel, he tells the worshipers of Baal that he's going to offer a big sacrifice to the god Baal. He says that Ahab, in verse 18, served Baal a pretty good bit, but I'm going to serve him much. Every worshiper of Baal needs to be here because I'm going to offer the best sacrifice to Baal that there is. And it says that when the worshipers of Baal came, Jehu said, make sure that nobody is left. Every worshiper of Baal needs to be here. And it says in about verse 21 that Jehu then gave them them garments to worship Baal in. If you go on to read that story about verse 23, it was basically a disguise. Jehu had men stationed outside to then kill all the worshipers of Baal once they had been assembled together. But that's the concept. The king would provide wedding garments. And to not wear those wedding garments to a wedding that the king had provided for you would have absolutely been a slap in the face to him. It would have been an insult to him. Not only has this king been rejected by the invitation, that would have been insulting enough. But now somebody has come in, accepted the invitation, and not worn the clothes that the king has prepared for him. And what does the king say? As a result of that, this man who did not have a wedding garment received the strictest punishment of anyone in the three parables that we've looked at. The two sons and the wicked vine dressers. What happened in the parable of the two sons? Well, Jesus just used that to say that because you rejected me, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Then in the parable of the wicked vine dressers, what was the indication there? You've rejected me. And Jesus says, I'm going to give the kingdom to someone that is worthy. Someone that will actually accept my invitation. And then right here in verse 22, what does this man who doesn't have a wedding garment on, what happens to him? He tells the servants to bind him hand and foot and throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Spiritually speaking, what happens to this person who is in the wedding hall, but he doesn't have on a wedding garment? He is cast into hell. The most severe punishment. So Jesus is saying then, what's the ultimate end? If you decide to reject me and my message, what's the end for you? 
Don't focus on the fact that I'm going to take the kingdom and give it to somebody else who's worthy. Don't take it on the fact that the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the harlots will enter the kingdom of heaven before you. Don't focus on that. What are you to focus on? What's the penalty if you reject me? What is it? Being cast into hell. That's pretty bad. About as bad as it gets. And then Jesus issues his statement from which we get our application this morning. Many are called, but few are chosen. So now that we've analyzed it, we've looked at the the concepts and the characters to, to fully understanding this story. What would have been going through the minds of the religious leaders? How do we apply this to our lives? What are some applications that we can make? Number one, we need to come as we are to receive the wedding garment. If you look at this parable, when Jesus sent out, or when the the king sent out the messenger into the main highways, it says that he gathered those who were good and bad. It didn't matter what they had done. It didn't matter what sin they had in their lives. It didn't matter what they had done, how many people they had cheated, how many people they had slapped in the face. It didn't matter. They all came into the king's house. Have you ever heard somebody say that I have too much sin in my life, God can't forgive me? Or I've done one bad thing. You just don't understand how bad it is. There's no way that God can forgive me. We don't see that mentality here in Matthew 22. Those who accepted the invitation, it didn't matter. The invitation was extended to those who were good and bad. And what did they all have in common? They all accepted the invitation. They came as they were. The wedding garments, we'll take care of that later. But you come as you are to receive the wedding garment. Spiritually speaking, there is no one in this room Nobody who is too sinful to put on the wedding garment of Christ. There's nobody. There is nobody in this room that is too sinful to reject the invitation that Christ gives us to come to his feast. Paul put it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15 that I am the chief of sinners. I am the chief of sinners. And God saved me, is what he's saying in chapter 1, verse 15. If I can come to Christ, if I can be transformed by Christ's example, by his grace, anybody can, because I'm the foremost of sinners. The question is, what's holding me back from coming and receiving a wedding garment? You might be asking, well, Harrison, what's the wedding garment? What is it that I'm supposed to put on? Paul makes it clear in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. He says that for all of you, my translation says, for all of you, all of you, doesn't matter if you're good, bad, etc. For all of you that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In verse 28, there's neither Jew, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, bond or free, for we are all One in Christ. What's the wedding garment? The blood of Christ. The wedding garment is the blood of Christ. And there is no one here this morning that is too sinful to receive it. Come as we are to receive the wedding garment. Second of all, what's the the second application? In order to be chosen, we need to stay clothed with Christ we don't need to put on that wedding garment and for whatever reason just take it off because we feel like taking it off in order to be chosen to be one of those who are chosen by Christ as faithful we have to stay clothed with Christ the word chosen there in verse 14 is translated as the word eklektos which is You can probably figure out what English word we get from that. It's the word elect or the word chosen. 
And it's often used by Jesus to indicate those who are his true disciples. That's what it means. Those who not only put on Christ in baptism, but stay the course. Who are faithful to the end. Who are then true disciples of Christ. Many are called, but few chosen. See what Jesus is doing here? This parable uses a conventional physical custom of a wedding to illustrate the unconventional kingdom truth that many people are called. The invitation is extended to everybody to come to God's wedding feast. But there are only a few who will accept it. And even fewer that Christ will choose as his elect. The question is, have we put on a wedding garment? Are we ready to come to God's abundant feast? He's invited every one of us. Every one of you are invited to the abundant spiritual feast that God has prepared, which is an eternal home in heaven with him, and we've talked about that. The invitation has been issued Jesus Christ has come and said, everyone is invited to the wedding feast of God. Everyone is invited to spend eternity with God. The question is, have you accepted the invitation? Are you ready? Are you ready? Come as you are and put on the wedding garment. There's, there's water ready. There are garments ready. There are towels ready for those who want to be baptized into Jesus. You can't go to the wedding without a wedding garment you can't go to heaven without the blood of christ and all we have to do is to come as we are maybe there's someone here that has shed the wedding garment maybe you were wearing it at one time maybe you were living a life that was clothed with christ but you've taken off the wedding garment let's put that back on this morning let's put that back on get yourself ready to spend eternity in god's wedding feast all things have been made ready come to the feast right now so together we stand and sing all things are ready come to the
morning. Please remember our monthly singing at 5 tonight. Come ready. We'll blend our voices and praise God together. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you then. Start with 756. 756. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. church here at Jacksonburg. Father, we thank you for all the members that we have here, Father. Dear Lord, be with Harrison as he keeps presenting wonderful lessons from your word, Father, that we can apply them to our lives daily. Dear Lord, be with all the ones that were mentioned. Get them back to their normal walks of life as I will. And most of all, Father, we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 